Thank you for coming and giving up this beautiful spring afternoon. Um, on behalf of the Friends of St. Mary, I'm pleased to uh, welcome you to what I'm sure will be an entertaining and informative talk. Uh, we're grateful for your support for, the, for our efforts um, to help maintain the fabric of our beautiful community church. Peter Jordan is an internationally recognised and award-winning photojournalist. His pictures have appeared on the covers of Music and Time magazine. He spent the late 1970s covering events in Africa, and many of you will uh, recall his um, presentation here three years ago uh, on his work during that period. Today's talk covers the subsequent years when Peter worked in the Middle East and other areas. Most of you will remember his photographs of Mar Margaret Thatcher riding in a chieftain tank, uh, which was taken during the Falklands conflict. Please give Peter a warm welcome. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, so, yes, that's right, I, I left Africa, and uh, that was 1981. Came to London, where I had a small house, and took up residency here again. And uh, it took a few months to sort of get into the swing of things, but by the beginning of 1982, I was asked if I could approach the Iraqi embassy and see if I could secure a visa to go and cover the Iran-Iraq war and for Time magazine. So I did that, and um, it was a lot of toing and froing between the embassy. It's very, uh, you can probably appreciate it, it was very difficult to to get journalists or photographers from the West into Iraq at that time. It was a very nice hotel, and, but I couldn't really do anything. They, they, they gave me a minder called Daboud, and he would drive me around, and every time I took a camera, I'd say, no, no, no pictures here, you can't, you can't do that. <laughs> and then uh, they would take me to some ministry building and say, well, I can take a picture of the people working in here. I said, no, that's not very interesting, I'd rather I'd rather see what's happening around in the countryside and maybe well, I could have a look at what's happening in the war. Then. Oh no, it's much too dangerous, you can't go there. So this went on and I spent that first visit really trying to make contacts and friends and pretty much came back home to London empty-handed. Uh, and so I um, spoke to my editor and he said, well, let's try again, ask another, another time to go. And I did that and that was put on hold and then Time themselves made a, a request to um, have an interview with Saddam Hussein, of which at least it, that might work. And then a visa came through for me, so off I went. And um, it was just about the time, in fact, I was there when the Falklands War started. So that was around about, I guess, March or April of uh, 1982. And for some reason, I managed to get a trip to the north of the country, onto the, uh, where the, the Iran border was. And they were, I arrived at a place and they were firing uh, 155 uh, howitzers over the hills into Iran. And um, that made some interesting pictures. And then I, the army took me to the first town over the border. And for, I always sort of laughed about it, I had lunch in Iran. Uh, in a, a, a sort of canteen that had been rigged up inside a, a mosque and a uh, huge uh, biryani came out and two men carrying it and tipped it out onto a great brass plate and I sat and ate with the, the guys there, this biryani. Then I was taken back to Baghdad and sent on my way. So the third trip was July the 4th, it was around about that time get into uh, Baghdad and I met by the, um, excuse me, the editor of the Washington Post, a man called Murray Gart, and the Middle East correspondent for Time magazine, Dean Brellis. And they said, we've got, a, we've got an interview with the president, but we're told to wait. So we waited in the lobby of the hotel for two days. 
I was dressed in my seer sucker suit I bought specially for the occasion. It was very sweaty and uncomfortable and we were afraid to leave, to go to the lavatory and one of us would have to watch in case they arrived. And then suddenly this car pulled up on the third day and a couple of uh, guys jumped out and said, Yalla, let's go. President is waiting for you. So um, off we went to his palace and I had all my equipment waiting. I had silver boxes with film and lighting equipment and things like this and got there and uh, Murray and Dean were waved straight through security but then I was scrutinised because of the cam ca cameras. So the army looked at it and said, no, no cameras. I said, but I'm going to take I've come all this way to take a picture of your president. They went, no, 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 you can't have a camera. We've got our own cameras. You can use them when you get inside the room. I said, what cameras? Well, they're cameras, you can use those. And I said, no, I'm afraid that won't work. I'm not going to go. So they said, you have to go. I said, no, I'm not going. Not without my camera. So they sent a, another a colonel, it was, sent him into the room where President uh, Saddam Hussein was. There was, I imagine, a conversation. He came back and said, OK, we've got to look at all your equipment. And, uh, and it was this time that I realised there had been a bomb at some other time that the president had planted with a journalist who was interviewing an opposition member. And when they came to the stage like this, he turned it on, <laughs> the bomb went off, and the rest was history. But anyway, so he was very suspicious about this. So they searched all my cameras and um, took the lenses off, looked at them inside, looked at the film, tried everything. Eventually I was passed and I went through and everyone was sort of waiting, nothing had happened, actually happened. So the camera I saw on the side was an old Roly cord, which takes a different size film to what I had with me, so it wouldn't have worked anyway. And uh, they were sitting there and it was, it was a bit like the president was sitting up higher, like in, it was like in a courtroom really, he was sitting up higher and Murray and Dean were sitting here and I was delegated to here and there was a lot of ar just army guys all around. So the first thing I did was go up to him and with a light meter to see what the light was and I was rushed, military guys came up because I got so close to the president they were very nervous. And so the shoot started and, and it went on for a while and for those of you who understand film, it was tungsten lighting. So you can't use daylight film. And uh, there's a different, there's a tungsten film you have which colour corrects the film. Because if you, as you might notice, some of these pictures in here look a bit red. That's, that's because of the way it's, it works. But they're not supposed to be red. But, so I had this tungsten film shooting away and it went on for quite some time. And at the end, through a translator, the president said to, uh, to uh, Murray, um, is there any other questions you were too embarrassed to ask me before the interview? And he said, well, there is one. Um, I believe uh, the local elections, of which you just won 98% of the vote, um, in the southern part of Baghdad, in uh, Daogda, you, uh, there was a lot of rioting and people weren't very happy with you. And suddenly he spoke back to the translator and a bit of a conversation, they said, okay, let's go. And they all jumped up. <laughs> and I thought I was going to lose my film, so I was hiding it in different pockets and taking it out. And we went outside, and uh, there were literally 12 black Mercedes lined up outside. And I was shoved into the back of one, two AK-47s on the back seat, which I sat on and had to move those. Murray and Dean disappeared somewhere else. Anyway, we drove to this exact place we said in Babda. And uh, there's the first picture I took of him when he was sitting up there. And that's been used quite a lot uh, on covers of various things. And it, actually, on a weekly basis, I still sell these pictures through my agent. Not for very much, it's usually pennies. But um, every week it sells. And so, the lighting was actually quite good, and it's, it's uh, for, for the kind of low level of what it was, that I was quite pleased. And, um, 
And then here it is in Baghdad, and that's Dean actually there, the only other Western guy you can see standing. And there's uh, in the middle here is Saddam waving and his troops around him. This guy drew his pistol down here, a few of them did afterwards. And uh, there's a lot of other pictures, I'm just including the one, and some aren't scanned, so I'll leave it to your imagination. But um, so there we were. And uh, then he, he took me into somebody's house. And this picture I've never really uh, bothered to, uh, to use or print. But for this occasion, I thought it was interesting to see that this president was, went into a house. None of this could have been prepared because no one knew that Murray's going to say, <laughs> you weren't very popular in this area. But he. he it seemed at the time he was, so it rather discounted that. It was very interesting. He gave them, I think in his hand, he's got a purse, and he left some money for the little boy. And um, this is another shot of, of him. And uh, I'll just go on that after this, uh, the war was um, building up around Basra. So, uh, I was, um, I was asked if I would go down to Basra with Dawood and see what was going on. And I said, will I get to see any of the fighting in the front? I went, no, not really, I don't think so. But you can go down. So we drove and it took all day. I left early in the morning. And we would, it took about 12 hours, I guess, to go from Baghdad to Basra. Checked into the Sheraton Hotel, and, and then um, I could hear artillery uh, fire and explosions. And then every uh, 20 minutes, some huge shell used to pass over our heads and explode half a mile away. There was some, I don't know what caliber it was, but it was something, it sounded like a train going by as it passed over. <laughs> and uh, so eventually they, they drove us, um, they drove us out. This is this is the Shat al Arab here, <coughs> and this is what Basra looked like in those days. Beside the the uh, there's I believe uh, a, a colleague of mine here, Homer. You went to Basra, didn't you? Yeah, the Marsh Arab. The Marsh Arab. That's right. And probably that was over where we see all this marshy bit. I don't know. I think it was up around there. So this was Basra in those days, pretty much flat. This is the. Shat al Arab, which because of the war got blocked and all of these ships were trapped. And I think even today some of them might still be there because the channel has silted up and they, they were just, that was it. They're, they had skeleton crews on them and uh, well, this was 40 years ago, they're still there. This was when they were, they were firing over the hills. I think uh, this was a probably a 155, and they were shooting over these hills. The Iran was just on the other side. And uh, that sort of at the time was the nearest I got to anything. The uh, in incoming stuff, this was terrible. They were using uh, 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 fire, um, incendiary shells, so this child got burnt. That's pretty, uh, pretty grim, I can tell you. So, um, So I went back to Baghdad and with these few pictures and it, it wasn't enough to really show what was going on. But I realized I was being watched by everybody all the time. So I thought, why don't I use that? So I sent a, a, a telex and this is how you communi communicated in those days. So I sent a telex, uh, you can see there by now it was the 14th of July and um, I guess you can all read that so you can see what I'm actually trying to say, was that um, maybe if the authorities read this telex, they might, they might do something. They might actually take me back to the front. Well, actually, indeed they did. In the middle of the night, I was woken up and driven to an airbase and um, flown to the front. There'd been the biggest tank battle since the Second World War. This is what we were going to report on. And um, 
I was put into a, I flew in a me helicopter and uh, it probably, it cut the time by, down to about three hours by helicopter, I had to stop and re refuel on the way. Um, then they, uh, they put me into a small two-man helicopter, or attack helicopter, that was being rearmed, and they took me and I, we landed in the desert, and I said, where are we? And the guy said, this is Iraq, and that's Iran. So I was right in the middle, which, uh, uh, this was, this was some of the uh, locals that were affected in the area. And, and then in this bit, here's, um, here's one of their tanks that got, one of the Iranian tanks that got hit. I think they were using chieftains at the time. And uh, this is pretty grim. And here is, uh, here's a different tank, another guy. It was just chaos in this area. Um, these were the guys working on the front line and it was, it was quite horrendous, really, I can, you can probably imagine. These two guys were prisoners and they were wounded, they were Iranians. And uh, I'm sorry about the redness, it's just, but I'm sure you can get the idea from there. And here, again, um, if you look carefully, you can see that they were booby-trapping their bodies. Dead soldiers that were left behind, someone would come and would stick a hand grenade between their legs so that even if they were being cleared by using bulldozers and things like that, there was still armament around everywhere. And in the trenches, uh, this is a frontline trench, um, I jumped in and thought I was standing on sandbags because everything was covered in dust. And uh, it was indeed uh, dead soldiers. Uh, pretty horrific. That ran as a page in the, in the magazine that following week. And then as I was there, over his sh head, shell bursts started to come in. And um, that is pretty terrifying because they explode maybe 150 feet in the air. and. Uh, there's very little place to take cover, so at this point I wanted to, uh, <laughs> to go back to the hotel, I think. <laughs> but uh, no such luck immediately. Um, their troops were being killed behind the lines, as you can see here. And these were, some were dead, some were injured. It was pretty, uh, you know, they certainly got me to the front anyway. There was no, no pulling the uh, stops out, out of this. Here was actually uh, an even worse tragedy. This is, um, they weren't, I noticed when I went there, none of them were actually wounded. And then I was told that it was um, Saracen nerve gas they'd been using. And these are Iranians. And beside some of the bodies was, um, hypodermic needles with, uh, with an antidote in them, but they hadn't had time to actually even use it. And I was, at this point, I didn't say, I've been joined by a, an English uh, writer called John Swain, who was doing a piece for the Sunday Times, and he did write about the use of nerve gas here. And uh, we were pretty surprised at the time that that's what they'd been using. This was also a surprise during this fighting in the last couple of days were um, all these prisoners. So um, this was quite a good ploy on the Iraqi uh, authorities to let me see this, to show that they weren't actually executing everyone or killing people, which is what the sort of propaganda would have been in Iran at the time, I suppose. And so Iran was also collecting prisoners, so eventually there were these huge prisoner swaps going on. Was, they had tens of thousands of prisoners. And actually they weren't, for, for, for the conditions that most people were living in, this was, this was not so, so terrifying, I don't think. Here's some guys that were actually wounded and they were sort of being looked after. 
So these are just recently, they're still in the clothes they were fighting in, so they're just recent casualties. So I then uh, got a uh, got another telex back. This is uh, July the 16th. It says uh, a big scoop. And <laughs> so everyone was very pleased, but then I had to get the pictures out. So nowadays with electronic cameras, you just press a button and transfer the picture. In, in 40 years ago, you had to get the film back to base. And for me, that was New York. So it's a long, long way from Basra. So uh, I, again, um, used the telex by saying I can't really get back and uh, I'm stuck here. And uh, Dawood arrived and said, there's a helicopter for you. So <laughs> I was flown back to um, Baghdad and um, put on a flight to Paris, uh, an Air Iraqi flight, Iraq Airways flight. And I'd called the office by telex and uh, told them when I'm, uh, well, this, 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 this telex doesn't have to pertain to that, but telling them I was arriving. So Agatha, in, our correspondent in Paris, was ready to meet me when I arrived with my film overnight. It was a Saturday morning. Normally the magazine closes on a Friday night in New York. So she got onto the Concorde and flew my film, hand carried it to New York, so it would arrive Saturday morning in New York, processed the film, got it to, to the uh, editorial department, do an edit, then put it into the magazine. These were un unusual times to run the magazine so late and then have it printed and on the streets of New York uh, on Monday morning and the rest of the world on Tuesday. So that was pretty good. So um, they were so impressed, they flew me back on the Concorde as well, which I was very pleased, <laughs> pleased to accept, <laughs> and went to London. And then they said, you've got to go back again on Monday <laughs> to Iraq. And I was, I was pretty exhausted. But that's what happened. And I, I took a whole, lot of, uh, a whole lot of magazines back with me. And, um, and, and they were pretty impressed. There was a Saddam interview that we'd done the stuff from the front line, and, and then things from the Iranian side reporting from Arman in Jordan. And then I got a hero gram, which is not very often, from my colleagues in uh, Beirut, because they were scheduled to be on the cover, and I apparently had knocked them off. And uh, you probably won't know any of these people, but some might, that's uh, from uh, Halstead Dirk. He died just a few months ago, sadly. Bill Pierce is still alive in, San, in uh, Los Angeles. Neveur Roland, a Frenchman, he lives in Asia still. And Kathleen Leroy, some of you may have heard of, she's also passed away as a French photographer. So that was from my colleagues, which was, which was quite, uh, quite impressive. So uh, I never went back to Iraq after that. I, I think that particular baptism of fire was, was enough. I had a young family by this time. I had uh, a daughter and uh, it, didn't, it didn't really um, attract me so much as before. But it was a good, good start and um, time had very good relations about covering anything in Iraq for a number of years until, of course, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, Kuwait invasion, which I'll come to later on in this uh, talk. I'm not going on too long on this. Um, uh, yes, so it was it, the political situation changed later when he invaded uh, Kuwait, and that was ten years after this, I guess. Um, so the next, I did go back to another conflict zone, unfortunately. It was uh, in 1983. I was sent to cover the conflict in um, Beirut, which some of you may remember, the Americans became involved, so were the English, so were the French, and so were the Italians. And they all had their own little bits to look after in Beirut. The Americans arrived, and this was an arrival picture. Um, it's on the uh, USS New Jersey, which was the 
biggest battleship of its kind at the time, and it was from the Second World War. And this Marine was laying out on deck and listening to the radio. And these guns were incredible. The shell they fire is, it weighs the same as a Volkswagen. And uh, they, they, they're really accurate. They could fire, these naval guns were fantastic. They could fire way into Beirut and uh, uh, take out a block of flats if they wanted to. They, 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 were, they were massive, massive guns. And they used to fill the magazines. I went in there with, with sacks of gunpowder, literally. They were like silk sacks. They'd poke into the, to the back of the gun and then put the shell in and then it would make a huge blast of flame when they went off. They were just incredible. Most impressive sort of thing. Anyway, it wasn't long before um, the American headquarters had been blown up and I had spent the day with them uh, at this place here, which was at the airport and it was... Um, they put their marine base there. This is now October 1983. It was the 23rd of October. Even in Vietnam, they didn't have death tolls like that in a day. It was, it was absolutely, uh, you could see by the sort of carnage that one bomb could make, a one truck bomb. It was absolutely huge. And um, funny thing about it, well, funny, the building came down and there was a guy um, surrounded by sandbags on the, uh, the roof of the building and he survived and I talked to him. And uh, he just lost his hearing, other than that, he was absolutely right. But uh, the people were crushed underneath. It was absolutely awful, awful. And um, trying to cover this was very difficult because on the other side of the runway, they were still shooting at us. And so uh, it was pretty difficult. This was, this was actually prior to this bomb going off. This was a sniper who was uh, dug in beside the airport. And actually, I couldn't get inside this bunker but I, I took a prism off my camera and put my hands down inside a hole and could see him and took a picture. So it's a very cramped space. It might look <coughs> as if there's a lot of room, but there's actually not. Um, and so that was interesting. Here was inside the camp, they'd written all their names, uh, those serving uh, in their, in their uh, living quarters. And I guess most of those names, the guys were, were killed because most of the people in that building were lost their lives. So this was a picture that I, um, I won quite a big award for, uh, the Overseas Press Club of America for best overseas reporting. And this was after a couple of days, which we've just seen recently in Turkey, people can survive uh, being inside a building for actually longer. Um, even up to a week or 10 days. Um, he was brought out alive, and this was quite a positive picture at the time. But looking at these soldiers now, and realizing this is 40 years ago, they, they looked pretty much like they did in the Second World War. They changed very much now in their uniforms. But this guy, there's been several stories about him. He survived and lived a healthy life afterwards. It was pretty remarkable, really. And, um, and this is searching through this rubble. It was, it was tragic. So body parts and all the unpleasant things that you don't, you don't normally think of when you're reading these stories. You don't get the real feeling of what it's like. It's, a, it's, it's, it's pretty awful. Anyway, here's my shipment. Um, I used to have to ship the film. I had a friend who was the... Um, correspondent for NBC in Israel, and I used to ship it uh, via Keith Graves, who was at the BBC. Uh, I don't know whether any of you remember his name from those days, but he used to get it down to Israel for me, and in this uh, is, is what I would send to New York and say there's 18 rolls here, and they're on there with 20, 22 rolls. Sorry, this is my shipment number 18. Because shipments could go adrift, we, we decided to number each shipment so we would know which shipment was missing, if any did. And, um, 
and that. That's that. We used to call it, I see it's not marked on this one, we used to call Israel Dixie because um, when you were sending these messages, we didn't like to mention the word Israel in case it upset anybody in, uh, in, in, uh, in Lebanon at the time. And so um, here was where it went on. They turned it into a crime scene. And uh, I think the rest is history about that. Here, the uh, British ambassador, the American ambassador, came to inspect the site. These were his uh, military bodyguards uh, that were surrounding him. Uh, it was a pretty interesting sort of snap of the civilian guy there. And this sort of ends this. As they arrived, you saw the picture of the guy lying on the decks of um, the uh, New Jersey. This was the end. This is them shipping coffins out. On uh, MAC stands for Military Air Command. They came out of Charleston in Georgia. This is shipping their dead home. And they were doing that within hours of retrieving bodies. They didn't waste any time at all. And that sort of brought an end to the American adventure in Beirut, and they slowly left after that. And um, that was pretty, pretty impressive, pretty impressive times, I suppose, to, to live through that. And it's the 40th anniversary this year, and they've opened a new, um, a new museum for the US Marines uh, at Quantico Bay. And that picture of the guy um, being pulled from the rubble is, is, has been blown up to um, several metres wide and it, will, it forms a, a, a new part of the exhibition in this, in this museum. So that's the opening. Anyway, back to England and then uh, <laughs> I was asked to cover the, um, the election in 1983. Of Margaret Thatcher, and this was her. She posed for a picture. Uh, I don't remember quite where that was. It might have been. It's cows. Is it? Is it cows? cows? Oh, well done. I, I couldn't remember. East, East cows. The Isle of Wight. <laughs> yeah, I do remember going there. But that's interesting. Yeah, she did that, and um, and then this you might have seen before. This was in in Germany. Uh, this is this is a. A crapping image, it's been used quite a lot. Uh, that same day, uh, uh, she was um, inspecting this going on, and there she is in the middle. It's quite a funny picture of her, I thought, with Helmut Kohl. And uh, that man with the binoculars behind her is George Paul. John, uh, no, I've forgotten his first name. Paul Clive. Charles, Charles, I beg your pardon, Charles Powell. Uh, he was her private secretary and he sort of was with her pretty much all the time uh, during when she was uh, in Downing Street. This was um, a trip we did. We left, uh, it was 1984, and we left um, on the 17th of December uh, and we flew around the world. Our first stop was uh, Bahrain. Then we flew on to, uh, it was Bombay then, which is now Mumbai. And we, she had a meeting with uh, uh, Gandhi, uh, who was, was since assassinated. Then we went on to Beijing to, uh, to prepare for the signing of the Hong Kong Accord. And that was really fascinating. Um, I was invited to dinner and it was a black tie dinner and I'd taken my, my dinner suit with me and it was fantastic. It was in the Great Hall of the People. And um, I was looking at the menu the other day, which was, which was quite fantastic. But each table had a massive ice sculpture in the middle and it had two orchestras. One was a Chinese orchestra, one was a Western orchestra. And, uh, and it was just a fantastic banquet. And, uh, uh, it was just, that was her walking around uh, in the sun there, 
and uh, on the flight, that's on the top behind her is Bernard Neenham, her uh, press secretary. So this was a sort of set up picture, I suppose. But I was travelling with, um, it was an RAF flight, so you're all sitting, as if you didn't know this, uh, back to front on these flights, so you're facing towards the back. And we pretty much slept on this plane for five days because it was a round the world trip we did. I think we completed it in five days. Uh, we picked up a day because we crossed the date line, I suppose. Um, and, uh, ah, this is, this was interesting. This was, um, it was for his birthday. I, uh, it was during the President's, uh, President Reagan's trip to, uh, <coughs> to England in 1984, and I got a call um, about 10 o'clock at night. No, it was in the afternoon. But they wanted me to go to Downing Street at 10 o'clock at night. And I said, why? They said, we want you to take a picture of the Prime Minister and um, Ronald Reagan. I said, why? They said, well, it was, it was actually Bernard who phoned me. He said, well, she wants to give the president the birthday present of her and uh, herself in front of Churchill. This is a portrait that's in, in inside Downing Street. And so I arrived, I don't know, about eight o'clock, took my lights in. And in those days, you could drive up to number 10 and park outside so I could unload my cameras. I went in and set them all up. It was quite sort of nerve wracking, I think. I put about three cameras in, with, loaded up the film, and they were in a cabinet meeting with all the American guys. There was, uh, uh, I can't remember all the names of these people now, but they were all there, and um, I was getting ready, and suddenly she appeared, and I got them in front of this picture, and, uh, and he, uh, he said to me, uh, who do you work for? And I said, Time Magazine. He said, oh, so you're one of ours. <laughs> and she said, no, Mr. President, he's one of ours, <laughs> which was quite funny. Anyway, <laughs> I, uh, I did the picture and it wasn't for publication, so uh, this was a, a completely private uh, arrangement. Uh, I got them printed and then um, I, I uh, gave a couple, asked for a couple to be signed by her, the prints, of which she did. And I sent one, both of them actually, to my picture editor, and he sent them to the White House and got President Reagan to sign them as well. So he and I had two, a picture each of these, both signed by both of them. So that's, uh, that was quite a, a memory, really. Um, and then here she is in China, in Beijing. That's Deng behind the little guy. I've actually got a picture of her being interviewed uh, with, with him, and at his feet is a spittoon, which is quite a funny picture, actually. Uh, they still use them there. Uh, that's Jeffrey Howe over there, you might recognize. And uh, this was in the West Country, uh, visiting a farm, and uh, in it she said, uh, what is this? And someone said, it's a manure, man. And uh, she put that down, that was a funny picture. <laughs> that was also in 1983. Uh, here, I've got a few sort of mixed pictures because she traveled around a lot. This is in Jordan with King Hussein. Uh, this is an, I guess she was selling arms, I don't know what she was doing, but it's all that. this is Charles Paul again, her private secretary in Downing Street. Uh, because in 19, towards the end of her premiership, I, I wrote to uh, Bernard and asked if I could do a shoot for Life magazine. And it, it took months to arrange. And eventually, uh, they said I could do a day in the life of her. And so um, I, I said, well, if we do that, I'd like her to change clothes for the different rooms we go to, because it'll look pretty, uh, not very interesting if she's dressed in the same clothes and in, in various rooms in Downing Street, so uh, no one would ask her. Because <laughs> they thought it was a bit of a cheat to say we want you to change your clothes throughout the photo shoot. So uh, 
I said, can I have a meeting with her so I can actually talk about what I wish to do? And that was agreed. So I went there and um, I said, Prime Minister, can we, um, I know this might be a bit of an imposition, but do you mind if you change clothes when we move to another room, when we do these pictures? Because I've got to move my lights, so it gives a window of opportunity for you to change. And she thought this was a great idea. She said, that's right, I can get, I can get Claudia in from Aquascutum and she'll bring all the clothes in and we can start choosing them. So and the, 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 her staff had, had no idea that they thought this would be a good idea. It just it really worked. So, this is part of a series of pictures that that um, that work really well. So here she is with with Charles, and um, well, not that one. She's in a factory. I haven't actually got these in the best order. But this is during that election when she was campaigning. And I'll get back to her in Downing Street in a minute. This is uh, this was during the Commonwealth Conference um, in. Toronto, and I was on board, I was invited on board the yacht actually, the Royal Yacht, for a, for a cocktail party, and then this happened afterwards, it was quite, quite interesting. Here she is with Gorbachev when he came, came to London, and I went on her trip, I should have added, I didn't only do the round the world, I actually travelled with her for about five or six years on all her foreign trips, so... I went to Moscow with her and uh, when she went in uh, 1986, it was in the spring of 86, and uh, it was the beginning of, 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 of the softening of relations between the West and Russia. That was pretty interesting. This was before the summit that Gorbachev had with Reagan in uh, Reykjavik. This is her with Ronald Reagan. He's, that was actually um, <coughs> that was in Washington, and she said made some joke, and he burst out laughing, and uh, that was quite good. <laughs> and here we are back in China. This is this is uh, inspecting troops. There's a lot of pomp and ceremony for that. It was, it was pretty good. And Camp David. That was the end of our fight around. She arrived at Camp David, uh, and that was also uh, interesting to see. And not many people got access to Camp David in those days. So we're back in Downing Street. Here she is with Dennis in the upstairs flat. Uh, you probably know that um, they had all the uh, rooms to sort of work in and entertain and stuff like that. But they actually live up at the top, which is sort of quite a pokey flat actually uh, but that's where their their private lives were and this was during uh, decorating one of the um, rooms downstairs she had to be in control of that as well and this is on that day when i was doing the shoot so you can see she's changed her clothes and um, i do have a picture of that there she is saying do you think i should wear this one and uh, i told her to uh, Sorry, I keep moving. Um, make her own choices. I thought that was best rather than get into the thing, will you wear this, and then, and then getting it wrong. <laughs> so here's the lady from Aquascuta going through all the different things. Uh, in the back there, under the windowsill, she had a collection of teddy bears. It's quite, quite strange. So it's sort of interesting. It's nothing fancy in, in that flat at the top of Downing Street. It's pretty... Pretty old Lowry print on the wall, or yeah. an original rather. Quite interesting. Uh, this is Dennis, that was his office. And he was very congenial, I quite liked him. And making me a cup of tea with, with my uh, lighting assistant. And um, shortly after this, I uh, finished the shoot, sh sh excuse me, shoot and was packing up, the, um, there, was a, the, there was a courier there who I gave the film to because it was also on deadline and it was, it, was, um, it was a Thursday afternoon and the film needed to get to New York for the deadline for Life magazine. And um, so the film had all been shipped and I was packing up and uh, she said, 
you haven't photographed my ball gown. <laughs> and I said, oh, uh, well, okay, let's, let's do it. And she came out with this number, it was just fantastic. So I, I, I got all the lights back up and, and she went up and down the stairs and then she said, well, I do some more with her and Dennis for a Christmas card. And it sort of went on and it became quite late. It was now about eight o'clock at night and then I was off with a gin and tonic and so I've got to go. So from there I drove into Waldor Street where, where um, Joe's was the name of the printer who would develop the film. And so I quickly got it developed and this came out and I phoned Life and said, I've got a cracking picture. You've got to wait and it's too late. The deadline's come and gone. You've missed it. And so I said, You've, Peter, just wait for this one picture. I'll put it on the morning's Concord again. And I did that, and it was so good, it ran as a double truck, which is a double page spread in Life magazine. And, and it was real, it really was worth it. That was good. And, um, and that came, that's sort of the end of the Downing Street era, because shortly after that, she um, resigned and John Major took over. Um, as this said, Saddam to Sade, so uh, they were interviewing her for um, a cover story and they, they seemed to have difficulty um, getting anyone that she would agree to who would do the photograph. So she wanted a guy called Scavulo to come over from New York and do the shoot for Time magazine and they weren't very pleased with that. So I said, do you mind if I go to Hamburg and talk to her and see? So I flew to Hamburg, checked into the same hotel, it was the Four Seasons, and um, just phoned her up, because you can do that when you're in the same hotel, it's not, <laughs> not difficult. And uh, I said, look, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm here for time, uh, work, I'm contract photographer with time, and I'd like to do, do the pictures for this interview you're doing with time. So she said, well, where are you? And I said, I'm about three floors above you. So she said, well, come down. So I went down to her room, well, it was a suite actually, and um, she said, well, why don't you join the tour? So this was fantastic. So uh, for the next week, I was driving around Germany and France on a tour bus with her. And uh, this picture, actually, I took, it's part of a, a, a series of pictures I took for the cover, and at this stage we'd gone to Paris, and uh, I was at the Jean V, and I turned one of the rooms into a, a little studio, and so uh, that was that was quite a good thing. This is with our band members, and we did that in one of the venues where we were going. They were a really nice bunch of guys, and this is in Cologne, uh, in front of the um, museum. Oh, sorry, the cathedral. And this was the shot I did, and that's how it appeared um, on time. So it's, it's uh, quite interesting. Um, without sort of banging my own drum, that going after Gaddafi was a little corner flat they used to do, and that was my picture as well. Um, <laughs> I'd, uh, the week before, um, I'd uh, flown to um, Naples, and um, I was going to join the Seventh Fleet to do some pictures on the uh, an aircraft carrier, and so I said, um, "This is going aside from the." I said, uh, "What sort of chopper are we going out on to the carrier?" And they said, "No, you're going on a fixed wing plane." I said, "Landing on an aircraft carrier? How do you do that?" And they said, "Well, it's a it's a cod." I said, "What's that?" Said, it's carrier on board delivery. So. I thought it was a joke at first. Anyway, uh, indeed, we got onto this little plane and I flew onto the aircraft carrier. And it's like a controlled crash when you land, by the way. It's, it's, really, it's really quite amazing. And then when you leave, you sort of, again, you're flicked off and you go off the end of the, uh, the carrier and the, the plane drops and you think you're going to hit the, the ocean, but it picks up and takes off. It's quite, quite an experience. But anyway, I did a load of pictures there, which was a separate story of planes taking off and landing on this uh, the USS Saratoga, part of the 7th Fleet.
This was her makeup artist. She flew in, him in from New York just to do her makeup. Was, and that was another picture I quite liked of her uh, in this little made up studio I had. Uh, during this time, as, uh, as you might gather, there was lots of other different pictures I was doing in between these main stories. This was Peter Gabriel at his club at St. James's. And um, this was a good shoot. I flew to, to, to Malaga to photograph uh, James Goldsmith. And that turned out as a cover as well on, on time. And it, he was a really interesting, interesting guy. And uh, his son, Zach, was just a child then. That's me in Jordan uh, when I was a lot younger. That must be about 40 years ago. <laughs> and um, I had to put this in. This is an old friend of mine, Terry Fincher. And we were on a shoot in the Caribbean. <laughs> and this, we spent a week sort of doing this. Uh, it was quite, quite fun. He's smoking a cigar, by the way. <laughs> um, Oh, also in between this, I was asked to go and shoot the, uh, the raising of the Mary Rose. And um, you can see at the back of this, there is a helicopter pad. And um, I've been taking pictures, sort of uh, just above where, it's, where it says Gory, I think. And um, this helicopter landed and out jumped a friend of mine called Louis Sahoyas. And he said, do you want to use the helicopter? So that's how I got this shot. He just let me take it up. I didn't fly it, but he let me go in his helicopter. The Mary Rose is just down here at the bottom, coming out of the water. And um, this was a strange, yeah, this was Prince Charles diving on it, actually, the same day. And recently there was a, a program about this on television. I don't know if anyone saw it. About the raising of the Mary Rose. Yeah. No, it's quite interesting. Uh, oh, another very nice trip was travelling on the um, Orient Express to uh, to Venice, and um, Princess Michael of uh, Kent and her husband were on board, and uh, that's the owner of the train in the background there, and they were. This was stopping in Switzerland on the way, someone gave us some flowers. And uh, as the train was leaving, um, I was taking these pictures from the platform and she said, it's a wonderful trip, it's a pity you're not with us. And I said, don't worry, I am. <laughs> jumped on the train, it was quite, quite a uh, This was Prince Charles um, uh, earlier. Uh, it was the independence of, uh, Rhodesia to Zimbabwe in, in the early 80s and um, I just thought it was funny how they'd arranged the uh, the black soldiers and white ones sort of uh, it, it, the whole line went black, white, black, white they were trying to say we're <laughs> we're now equal and it was just a very funny way of uh, illustrating it all. now that was uh the Queen at Windsor Castle with Ronald Reagan on another occasion, and they went riding. And uh, this was the marriage of uh, Sarah Ferguson, I think it was. Uh, Margaret, the Prince, and uh, the Queen Mother. This was the Queen in the Caribbean, part of those pictures I took when Terry was laying in the water. And uh, Here's another one. And then I went to live in uh, Mexico for about a year. And, uh, and no one spoke English wherever I went. It was, so I had to do a crash course in Spanish at the Instituto Norte Americano and spent uh, every day for a couple of months going there. And uh, I think I learned pretty quickly, but I also forgot most of it pretty quickly, I think. But it was useful while I was there. This was um, bullfighting in Nicaragua. Uh, and I was with a very good friend of mine, uh, Sylvia Plahi. She was there as an art photographer, and she did some fantastic 
pitches around this blue bullfight as well. And this picture, actually, I won a first prize at the World Press for child labour, which was this boy was um, was 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 selling charcoal. And uh, there's a little cast from this, but it's not bad. That's, that's I'm quite proud of that picture. And I went to Peru as well, um, where they were panning for gold, <coughs> but it coupled with the destruction of the uh, the Amazon. And that was that was very uh, an interesting story, but uh, I did it on my own, and it never really. I sell pictures from this now, but at the time, no one was really interested in the story. But it was, I quite it was quite fascinating. This was when they came in and uh, with their bits of gold, and uh, he would weigh them. And uh, oh, that was another funny story down there. The killer bees. Um, this was at the Panama Canal. They were trying to stop the bees crossing over from South America to, to North America, but uh, that didn't work. I don't know whether anyone knows the story of these bees. That they'd, um, someone crossbred a honeybee with a kill, an African killer bee, and, um, and they, thought, they did it in the jungles of South America, and someone let them all escape. And, that's what happened, these killer bees spread throughout South America up into the north. Not so much for killing people, which they did do en masse, they, they more were destroying honeybees, and, and, and it was a huge threat to farmers at the time, because uh, they trucked them around in America to pollinate their, their crops. And this was a huge threat to the Americas. And it seems to have, uh, nature seems to have sorted it out by uh, they couldn't survive in the north winters. This was something else I was probably doing in Barcelona. Um, this is an actress called, um, and the name's gone right out of my head. <laughs> it's a Polish actress. Uh, sorry about that. But she was lovely. I'll think of it when I passed her by. This is um, Garcia Marquez. Uh, he lived in Mexico City. I'm obviously <clears throat> almost talked out, so I'm sorry. Gabriel Garcia Marquez, that was his name. And the actress, who I must go back to because she was so lovely, was Hannah Shigula. And they collaborated on some films together and writing. And uh, I think he died just recently, sadly. She's still alive. He was an interesting man. This was General Sir John Hackett, and it's in the Cavalry and Guards Club in uh, in Paul Moore. And uh, to assist me that day was a writer friend of mine who's written, se written several books on Africa, called Angus Shaw, and he helped me. Uh, well, he put the lights up, and I did this. Uh, Portrait, and it was uh, it was right as his book cover or his latest book at the time. And he was a wonderful gentleman, and um, he uh, he said, while your man is um, clearing up your gear, why don't we go and have a glass of champagne? <laughs> so Angus was very humiliated and red in the face that he was clearing up my stuff, and I went for a glass of champagne, and he said, uh, tell your boy. Um, when he's finished, to join us in the bar. And uh, he did, Angus came in sheepishly, and uh, we were drinking champagne, and he said, what would you like, a beer? It's <laughs> hugely <laughs> <laughs> funny. Angus has never let me forget it. But we <laughs> anyway, he was a, it was a very interesting man. This was Ian Smith after mm. he would retired, and I went to see him on one of my visits to Zimbabwe, and, he was very ironic, he was quite funny. He, I, I said, where are you living now? And he said, you can't miss it. I live next to the Cuban embassy. <laughs> and that's indeed where he did live. And uh, he lived very happily uh, and was never attacked and lived safely until the end of his life in, in Harare. And uh, this was one of his sidekicks, I guess. This was during the, um, the farm invasions. 
So, uh, and this was one of the farmers who'd taken over uh, someone's farm that I actually knew. And this mm. was another, this is... Uh, Laura Heard. Yes, and uh, her daughter, Jeanette Scott, who was married to a very good friend of mine, uh, Bill Radenacre, who was a, a writer for time. And uh, before that, she was married to Mel Torme, the jazz, jazz singer. <laughs> And so, actually, I, 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 I used to often spend my Christmas with them while I, was, when I wasn't married. Um, and then, finally, I went back to do the Iraq business in Kuwait. And uh, I didn't go during the war because things moved on from covering wars. Uh, you had to be embedded. And embedded meant you were you were sanitized. In other words, you were you were controlled by the army, and you were only allowed to take what they would allow you to see. And so, people like Don McCullum, I'm not putting myself necessarily in that uh, bracket, but there were a lot of photographers: Jim Nackway, Don McCullum, uh, Bill Pierce. There was a lot of Arab-speaking photographers I could think of. None of them could cover this war with the Americans in Cuba. It was purely, they were mostly from Washington. So I decided to cover the aftermath, which was actually really, you were free, there was no one else there, and it was really most interesting. This was, um, this was uh, uh, Iraqi gunners uh, in placements on top of buildings all around the city. And they left so hurriedly that they'd left their weapons still there, loaded up a week later. People just could play around with them. And, and then, of course, these were the local militia that were there, uh, who'd been, you know, supported. But what, what was really interesting was the light. Because the burning oil filter turned the sky totally black, and this is a daytime shot. Uh, the sky is completely backed and the sun uh, setting in the evening that just sort of was shining underneath this cloud of black which was reflecting its own shadow onto the desert. So it's, it's just fantastic and like here it looks like Dante's Inferno with this is a police station with everything still on fire. It was it was just incredible. This is another daytime shot in the desert, completely black sky. It was, it was just eerie. It was so completely unnatural. I mean, if any of you have witnessed a, an eclipse, I'm sure you have, it gets dark, but it's nothing like this. And you've got weird things happening in the sky too with these fires, uh, which, as I say, after the war had ended a week or two before this, Everything was still on fire. It was it was just incredible, and, and this again during the day, burnt out tanks, the desert. It was just wreckage everywhere. Uh, you can see more clearly how the sky can turn black with this. And uh, this was uh, clearing minefields there. So that was another job that the British had to do, and it was interesting that. Um, it was easy to do, really, because they had m maps of these minefields. The, the Iraqis had left maps, <coughs> given over maps to them. So most of them could be cleared easily. Mines that were left in Africa were never mapped. They just put them anywhere, and so they're still there today. So it was sort of done in a, a proper fashion that you could actually clear the mines relatively uh, quickly. And more th people used to steal cars, they all got stuck in the desert during this war. It was just, look at them all, all turned over, it's just incredible. And, uh, oh, I, I, I found this this morning. I used to keep a diary wherever I went, and often when I was travelling, I didn't because it was something else to carry. But on this occasion, I was actually writing daily. And so uh, here I can see quite clearly it's March 18th. I flew to Saudi on a C1, flew on a Saudi C130 into Kuwait. So I just sort of hitched a ride. I got from Bahrain, I crossed the causeway 
to uh, Alcatraz, I think it is, and just went to uh, the uh, headquarters there and hitched a ride on a on a Hercules with all my stuff, <coughs> and um, set up camp in a in a hotel room with no door on it. It had all been knocked off, and uh, no water and no electricity. So it was pretty tough staying there for a while. But it gives you an idea of how. Um, important it is to keep a diary that you can go back because I couldn't remember all of these details and uh, I can see here I said early start with the British first stop on the Sir Galahad um, for breakfast of egg and bacon and uh, actually I, I was winched on board by a helicopter so that is quite interesting as well to be winched out of a helicopter <laughs> Uh, this was the port in Kuwait. I, I like this picture a lot um, because of the stillness of everything, but still this eerie light was around. It's fascinating. This was my driver uh, who uh, was very, very brave because he didn't have to do all this. So he was driving around and there was a lot of armaments all left on the floor everywhere all of this stuff going on. Not long after this, actually, there'd been a film crew where um, they, they burnt alive uh, because the desert suddenly caught fire and they were in the middle of it and whole pools of oil went up. So it was pretty dangerous. This was people escaping Kuwait City and, and that was the wreckage. It was like a highway of hell that the Americans had uh, attacked as they were leaving. And you can see the power of these flames, it's just unbelievable. This was a quick shot of the press still working there, just to see how it is in modern times, more modern times anyway. And this is, uh, yeah, you can see what actually happens uh, when pretty much a direct hit comes in to these vehicles that are destroyed. It's just amazing. You can see what happened to tanks. <coughs> Makes me think of the, they say they're so important to send them to the Ukraine. I'm not sure if they, they're not as safe often as you think. I don't know what they build them like now. I'm sure someone here knows a bit more about them than I do. This was, um, <laughs> BA was just unfortunate to a land in Kuwait City just as Saddam's forces arrived. So during the fighting it caught fire and I, I did pose this picture because I thought it was kind of ironic. That's my driver <laughs> sitting in the middle of the uh, British Airways jet. And uh, just so it wasn't all bad, I also went to Iceland a couple of years later and this was a factory and the hot water from the, uh, from the um, Pieces, hot water, they use they used that to run the factory. <coughs> and after that it comes into this pool and, and it's it's called the Blue Lagoon and people relax. And the guy who was running said, Why don't you get in? On this rare occasion I swapped my gear for a costume and got inside and it was absolutely fantastic. And I thought I'd end on that picture that that kind of these are the things that one should really remember. Okay. <laughs> so, that's that. Okay, thank you. That was quite uh, an amazing. I've got a dry throat now. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea you had such a, a breadth of subject matter. Well, it's restricted in two ways because I could only show at the moment, as I was explaining to my colleague there, Homer, I could only show pictures that have actually been digitalised because this was all on film. Yes. And so I'm restricted to that. So some of the things I was saying, there was nothing to illustrate it because they've not been digitalised yet. Yes. As you can see, I'm sort of slightly behind the curve on that one. <laughs> yeah, we very enjoy it. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.